Hello everyone. In this video, I am reviewing the recent book Homo Irealis by Andre Aseman. This book is a collection of essays about a whole range of different topics, even though they are related. But the topics include the mind, memory, how we remember, and how we anticipate the future, places, cities, and specifically Alexandria is discussed, New York and Paris, and a few other places. Different relationships that we might have with cities, uh, belonging, Sometimes to a city we feel like we belong or almost belong or we feel out of place. The feeling of nostalgia is discussed when we think about the past. Another topic is reading books. Authors that are discussed and analyzed are, they include Freud, Pascal, Sebald, Proust, and Pessoa, just to name some of them. Another topic is watching movies. Especially the movies of Eric Romer are discussed at length, but also another important movie for me uh, personally the movie called The Apartment by Billy Wilder. Another topic is romantic relationships, being stuck in the friend zone, and uh, so forth. So the topics of these essays are very personal, and the style of writing is very intimate. The central theme of the book, if we have to pick one theme that holds all the other discussions together, that theme is imagination. And the idea that every part of our life, relationships, traveling, cities we live in, all these parts of our lives are charged and shaped by our imagination. As I was uh, preparing this review, I kept thinking about this example that I think might be helpful in bringing in some of the ideas that I want to discuss. Uh, a scene from the 1972 movie called Play It Again, Sam. In this scene from this movie, the lonely and neurotic character named Alan Felix, played by Woody Allen, the movie is a Woody Allen movie. This character, Alan, approaches a young woman in an art museum and nervously tries to have a conversation with her. They join in looking at a painting together, and then Alan asks her, what does it say to you, like the painting? What does it say to you? We, the audience, as we are watching the, the film, we know that he is not hoping just to have a discussion about art. He's hoping for intimacy. He wants to get to know her, have a conversation with her. Maybe she will like him, Maybe they can get together and he doesn't have to be alone anymore. So that part is in his imagination. So in this Woody Allen scene, we can divide the, the man, the, the male character's experience into two sides, two, two groups. On the one side, we have reality. And on the other side, we have imagination. So on the side of reality, we have the museum, the actual stuff, the concrete objects. And the museum, the place, the, the woman, the fact that they are strangers, other people, the paintings, and so on. All the, phys the physical aspects, uh, let's say. On the other side, we have imagination. And on that side, we have the fact that he's hoping to, to get to know her. Maybe she will like him. Maybe they will fall in love. And maybe he doesn't have to be alone anymore. So reality, imagination. Actuality and possibility. Although we can divide his experience in that way, it isn't fair to do that. And a lot of this book is devoted to that point that we cannot neatly divide our experience and our life into two sides, reality, imagination, actuality, and hypothetical or possibility. It is not fair to do, to do that. It is not accurate to do that. That division does not correspond to our experiences. In our experience, what is real and what is imagined are so intertwined and entangled with each other that we cannot dissociate them. In that example of the museum, that scene, the painting, the woman, the whole scenario takes its meaning for the man with reference to what this character is imagining, what he wants, what he's hoping for. And whatever he perceives initially, at least initially, feeds into his imagination. He's making sense of that whole situation based on what he's hoping to achieve or what he's hoping for to happen. So he's not just seeing a woman concretely and pure, just pure perception without any meaning. Everything is enframed in terms of, in terms of what he is hoping, what he's imagining. He wouldn't do what he's doing without that hope, without the possibility, the possibility that he's think, thinking about, without what he's imagining. So the concrete experience is enframed and colored in terms of this character's imagination. And what Asiman does in this book is very similar to what Woody Allen does in that scene. 
He begins the book by talking about, for example, his childhood memories in Alexandria. And he says that it wouldn't be fair when he's talking about his memory. It wouldn't be fair to simply say that I remember my childhood in Alexandria. Because at the time that he was, in, as he was a child in Alexandria, he wasn't just living there. He wasn't just experiencing the life in that place. He was hoping to get out. He was hoping to leave Alexandria and go and live in Paris. So his childhood memory of being in Alexandria is intertwined and entangled with the desire and plan and hope, imagination of leaving Alexandria and be in Paris. So that memory, what he is now nostalgic about as an older man, his, nostalgia, his nostalgia is about his memory of a child in Alexandria imagining leaving Alexandria and living in Paris. It's very complicated, but it makes sense. And if you reflect on our own experiences, a lot of time we have these kinds of back and forth um, with, our, with our relationship with time and events. The first time uh, I read the book, this collection of essays, the first time that I finished reading it, my reaction was not very positive. I thought, okay, very beautiful language, but I mean, what's the point? It's not really going anywhere. And it, actually, the essay seemed quite self-indulgent. I kept... You know, I kept reading and I kept thinking, oh, you're so self-indulgent. Why are you doing it? Why are you just staying with these feelings for so long? Because I thought that he's writing about the passage of time and uh, his and our inability to feel at home in the world. And he was describing a kind of helplessness against the facts of life. The fact that we cannot go back in time and change the facts of our lives. And facts about human experience. And I thought that he is very passive and I thought that his outlook reinforces a passive relationship with life. And I thought that he, he, this irrealist mood that he is introducing in, in, the, in, the, in the book and at length discussing and analyzing, this irrealist mood is essentially an escape from a reality that he finds to be unbearable. So I thought this is, in essence, in a nutshell, that's the book. But I felt like I, I missed something, so I read the book for a second time. And in my second reading, I realized that he isn't just talking about inaction and pa passivity. And like, oh, I'm so helpless. I can't do anything about the facts of life. And time is passing and people are, you know, I can't go back to my old relationships and my old, old places and old opportunities. He's not just talking about inaction and passiv passivity in the face of that, those facts. He is attending to a space of imagination and trying to observe as much as possible in that space, as much as possible about that space. And that's not a space of inaction. It is a space of deliberation. The space of imagination that he is inhabiting and analyzing in this book, it is, yeah, it is a space that is relatively speaking passive, but that passivity is a condition that makes possible, it's a condition of possibility for our decision-making and deliberation. So it's a space before our decisions and actions. So moving on, with this book, we realize that imagination needs to have roots in reality. It has to be grounded. So our experience of reality, our experience of concrete, tangible, with the tangible world, with the concrete world, that provides us with a launching pad, a scaffold with which we can now imagine. And that reality is, in, in many times, many instances, it is firm enough, the reality is firm enough, reliable enough, to be taken for granted and to be ignored. And we need to be able to ignore parts of reality in, or, in order to immerse ourselves in our imagination. So we already talked about the Woody Allen scene as one example. Another example is Billy Wilder's uh, classic movie, Apartment, The Apartment. And in that movie, the character, the main character, C.C. Baxter, is stuck in a situation where he is being unfair. He has to repeatedly make a decision to be un that is unfair to himself and ultimately also to the person that he loves. And so he has to imagine his way toward the right action, toward the just and toward justice, the just action, away from his present reality. Another examples discussed in this book are, come from Eric Romer's movies. And in Eric Romer's movies, we have romantically, the characters that are romantically very experienced and very savvy, they have no problem meeting and getting romantically involved with other people. But at the same time, against that background, they want and they imagine moving towards innocence and monogamy in contrast to what the actual life is. 
And in, con in, in contrast to that, the author writes about his own condition as a teenager, which is the opposite of those characters in Romer's movies. In contrast to them, uh, our author was inexperienced, awkward, and imagining intimate encounters against the background of his innocence. So in all of these cases, we have reality, concrete reality, actual life experiences that provide the scaffold for our flights of fancy, for our imagination. One of the discussions that for me was very impressive and made a very strong impression in my mind and branched out of this discussion of imagination was the meaning of intimacy, true intimacy. True intimacy, Asimov talks uh, as uh, Asimov envisions it. True intimacy is when that space of imagination, the space in which we consider and contemplate uh, possibilities, that ambiguous space of ambiguity, the space in which events are ambiguous, when that space is shared, that is when we have true intimacy with someone. When two people who might become lovers, they are maybe on a first date or second date or a third date, and they, they are in that ambiguous phase where they might take a step towards intimacy, for, towards physical intimacy, and instead of having sex, they differ that, that decision and they consummate in Asaman's language. They consummate their love in speech. They talk. They, they go to the meta date. Uh, face and they talk about their interaction instead of instead of losing themselves mindlessly in a physical interaction and then of course there is a Proust example Proust's grandmother main character's grandmother in somewhere in in search of lost time the main character as a young man decides with his grandmother that after he wakes up he knocks on the bordering wall the wall between their rooms so the grandmother hears his knocking and wakes up and knows that he is awake and he he's ready for tea or biscuit or whatever but when the main character wakes up proust's main character wakes up he cannot knock because he doesn't know if the grandmother is awake and he doesn't want to wake her up but she is on the other side and she knows that he's awake and that he's hesitating that he doesn't want to wake her up so she comes to him anyways and asiman here says this is intimacy this is the true intimacy. She doesn't, she didn't understand just his decision, but his indecisiveness. He understood his ambiguity, the ambiguity of his mind, the indecision of his, of his mind. That space of imagination in which decisions, ideas, possibilities are contemplated. In two places, uh, at the beginning and at the end, Asiman uh, talks about the irrealist mood and how that is captured in one word, and that one word is almost. So let me end this video review with a quote near the end of the book about the word almost. Quote, there is not a page I write where the word almost doesn't slip in to mollify and mitigate anything I say. It is my way of undoing what I write, of casting doubt on anything I write, of remaining uncertain, untethered, unmoored, unaligned, because I have no boundaries. Sometimes I think I am all shadow, end quote. So in general, I would recommend if you're interested in topic of imagination, psychology, art, reading, traveling, it's a very enjoyable book, but it might take, if you're like me, it might take a second or third reading to fully appreciate the book. All right. Thank you very much for your attention. And I will speak with you in the next video.